Hello there, and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 415. That's 415 of the Agostino Zynga Show. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. How am I? You know, doing the best that I can with the time I have allotted to me, as I'm sure most of you are doing the same too. If it's your first time watching this video via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and of course, leave me a comment down below. That would be more than appreciated. And of course, if, 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 if you're listening via any other platform, make sure you share it, download it, spread the love and all that good stuff. And of course, support via Patreon is always more than welcome. You can find a link in the description. It's patreon.com for just Agostino. And for as little as $1 or equivalent of one pound per month, you get access to the free bonus show that comes out at the end of this week so make sure you sign up on patreon to get access to that free bonus show only available to patreon subscribers big up my subscribers so far that i've gotten there select or click on there or subscribe on there at patreon.com for just agostino that's patreon.com for that's a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o don't delay get involved today <clears throat> but yeah here we are the day before the xmas the day before christmas hope you guys are doing well um what can we say? It's not really uh, much of a Christmas, is it? You don't really feel much of the holiday spirit. You know, makes complete sense considering what we're all kind of collectively going through with this uh, panoramic. <laughs> um, there's no real light in the tunnel for any of us unless we happen to live in Southeast Asia or the Oceania Pacific, right? This sort of um, Australia, New Zealand era, um, area, although I have seen reports of localised lockdowns and stuff being put into place. So, you know, nowhere, nowhere on earth is getting away with this scot-free. There is, um, who's the guy? There is a book out, right, by this guy called Nicholas Christakis. Um, I think I might have tweeted about it earlier. He's got this book that he put out and it speaks about plagues. And I think he made a point about... um. A pretty intelligent point where he says something like, "Oh, you can think," because I'm I've been trying to think about it myself. Right? I've been like, "Okay, I'm sitting here, you know, blaming all the world's governments in the West for their lack of preparedness and you know just general crappiness when it comes to um, correctly dealing with it when it comes to COVID." But maybe there is something about a virus that it essentially always is going to cripple a society especially one that's like interconnected as we are right we're like a what do they say um what do they say you are like a citizen of the world right or that whole dumb phrase that means you know you can travel to most especially if you live in europe you have a passport that allows you to go nearly just about everywhere business is mostly online um different lines of communication the drugs trade um, whatever else happening there's mad stuff going on here that just makes the world interconnected in a way that's just never going to be reversed so it's pretty difficult to um halt a virus that's airborne in the world that we live in now it's just now and impossible um you know you're not going to get away with having like there's never going to be a scenario where a country will have zero deaths just not going to happen and um this niggas Christakis made a good point about it echoing the same sort of sentiments basically saying hey this is is what it is we've we've faced more dick more difficult circumstances in the past um but because this is the first that we've sort of kind of gone through in a modern era we're all kind of panicking but it will pass but we just have to you know um what's that word called we're just gonna have to tough it out until it does pass but for sure we're gonna have to go through it there's no way we're gonna get around it so this is yeah this is it i found it. it's on the telegraph no, the Daily Star actually, even worse. One of our little ragtag newspapers who we have here in the UK. Let me get this up here. So it's an article from the Daily Star. <clears throat> it says the Roaring 2020s will be post COVID vaccine sex fest and an era of vice indulgence. So you can understand why Daily Star wanted to post it, right? Daily Star used to be that. I'm pretty sure it was a paper when I was in school that used to have all the um i wouldn't say nudes but like you know a lot of the topless young ladies pursuing a modeling career in the pages similar to like the sun right they'd have page three they have a you know a girl topless but usually they'd have they'd be full of stories about people bonking and having affairs and um the sort of um the sort of advice column will be about you know husbands cheating on wives with their sisters It'd be like some crazy 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 stuff never never tame it kind of reminded me like of a of a broadsheet version of uh 
a tabloid version of what of that Jerry Springer show. That's what it sort of reminds me of. So let's get this article up here. But 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 boom. Bear with me a sec. It's still loading because my computer is slow as hell. But we move in it. We move. So let's block that. Let's go here. Bear with me one sec. So this is the article here. Uh, Roaring 2020s will be a COVID vaccine sex fest and an era of vice indulgence. Um, it says here, the rest of the 2020s will be filled with a sexual litigiousness after people across the world emerge. I've got to pause. Where's all these auto videos everywhere on these sites? It's horrendous to use. So um, the rest of the 2020s will be filled with a l- sexual litigiousness after people around the world emerge from lockdowns enforced by the coronavirus pandemic, um, says an expert. The exciting prediction has been made by Yale professor Nicholas Christakis, Dr. Nicholas Christakis, in his new book called Apollo's Arrow, The Profound and Injuring Impact of Coronavirus on the Way We Live. Of course, you know I'm about to buy that. Social epidemiologist Dr. Christakis says society may, um, will make up for lost time as soon as it's safe to. He said, during epidemics, you get increases in religiosity. People become more abs- um, abstent- abstentatious. They save money. They get risk averse. And we're seeing all of that now just as we have with hundreds of years during the epidemic said Chris Takis told the Guardian but, but, but he says in 2024 all of those pandemic trends will be reversed so even he's suggesting right this is I think a recent interview too um, so even he's suggesting the same sort of thing that he heard people talking about where more than likely a return to normal which means whatever you did in 2019 you're probably gonna be able to do it from 2022 onwards at the earliest but this idea that somehow you know 2021 things are going to go back to normal is insane really considering what's going on if, if it does happen cool but for the most part all the experts are saying 2022 onwards so kind of prepare yourself mentally for that so you don't get caught off guard the following um people will relentlessly seek out social interactions he said dr krizaka says that this could include sexual litigiousness uh, liberal spending and a reverse on relig- religiosity he went on one of the arguments in the book is that what's happening to us may seem to many to be alien and unnatural, but plagues are not new to our species. We're just new to us, or they're just new to us, which I think that was a really good line, right? Let me repeat that again. One of our arguments in the book is that what's happening to us may seem to so many people to be alien and unnatural, but plagues are not new to our species. They're just new to us. And I think that's what we all sort of wrangling with, right? We haven't really, I think... With the, with the exception of maybe some of our Mediterranean folks who have kind of come here due to the downturn in their economy or people who left, you know, war-torn countries, it's very rare that you'd see, I don't know, millennials, it's very rare that you come across a millennial that's been through real hardship that's kind of been outside of their control, right? Like in terms of, you know, um, global issues that's not allowing them to, you know, move around freely, work where they want, live where they want. Those, you don't really see that for the most part especially if you live in the West, right? If you love, if you come from the Middle East, it's a bit different than maybe parts of Eastern or Central Europe. But for the most part, we've kind of got away with life scot-free. We've been, you know, easy peasy. The most difficult thing we have to sort of face every day is, you know, whether or not the Wi-Fi is working, wherever we're about to go, our phone being charged, um, you know, whether we're wearing the, um, the adequate clothing for the weather. But apart from that, life has been pretty good. So it's no surprise that some of us are freaking out with this lockdown because we haven't faced any 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 hardship whatsoever um but again i think the more you sort of the more you sort of come to a realization that this is part of course it's a standard thing that kind of happens to human society human species and for the most part we always kind of bounce back you know that's why we're basically here for the most part um i think you're going to be put yourself in a far better place because I don't, I don't know because again it's odd because there is a feeling especially in the news there's a lot of like doom doom mongering is that what it calls or scare mongering sorry where they sort of essentially every day there's an existential threat that is just looming outdoors waiting to kill you which is obviously not true but then i'm also not a fan of the overly optimistic stuff where it's like you know next year suddenly you know when it's january 1st one minute past midnight all of a sudden things go back to normal that's not going to happen either like let's be a bit sensible so the quicker you're able to sort of um come to grips with that reality the better it'll be for you when somehow you know especially this next year when summer hits people are going to be feeling a little bit more antsy than they are now okay it's all well and good staying indoors in the winter it's easy but when it comes to you know 
you open your you open your curtains in the morning and it's the sun's beaming in your face which it not usually doesn't especially here in london you're going to be very you're going to be very itchy to get back to normal but the more you realize that that ain't going to happen for maybe another year or year or two at most um you'll be in a far better place it continues here in his book, he argues that once pandemics end, there tends to be a period that people seek out extensive social interactions and which Dr. Christakis predicts will be a second roaring 20s, just as it was the case after the 1918 flu pandemic. Um, but, but, but continues here, says, and while many Brits have criticized the government's response to the pandemic, Dr. Christakis claims it is the disease itself and not the actions of those in charge, which is mostly directly causing people's hardship. He says, many people seem to think the actions of the government causing um uh many people seem to think the uh, it's the actions of our government that are causing the economy to slow that's false it's the virus that's causing the economy to flow um because the economies collapse even in ancient times when plagues happened and even when there wasn't um there was no government saying close the schools and close the restaurants that's true and imagine back then there was no there's not there wasn't as much um social mobility mobility yeah mobility happening back then i can imagine in that area, right? It wasn't easy to just get on a plane and hop over to flip in Switzerland or Jamaica or whatever. You had to kind of just stay where you were. If at most, maybe head out, head out onto the country. I think that's been a common thing. I think I remember reading or watching a documentary about the plague and I saw something about um, populations deciding it's just part of us. Whenever there's something like this happens, we tend to kind of go out into the country because we have this idea maybe it's a it's something that's sort of like hard-coded in us where if we get out into nature and we have fresh air that somehow it's going to revitalize our organs and kind of uh, uh, render us immune to the covid but so far that hasn't been proved to be correct he says it continues here he adds that the current pandemic has actually fought better than any other which has um, come before he says we're the first generation of humans alive who has ever faced this threat and that allows him to respond in real time with with efficacious medicines he said it's miraculous which is true um considering we have a vaccine actually in the space of a year which is absolutely insane i know some people are like hey it's not legit um, i'm not gonna take it blah 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 but for them just the fact that we have it and it's been approved is pretty insane um considering just how long these things do what have gone on in the past especially without the technological advances we have at the moment so hold tight um i'd guess tighten your seatbelt if need be um you know splash your face with water in the morning and come to a realization that this is probably going to last you know for another year if not, if if it, it, you know at the least at the very very least but there will be a light at the end of the tunnel and when it does come um it's going to be excellent just imagine what the um, what society is going to be like after spending this amount of prolonged time, you know, under some sort of restrictions where you're not able to move. Um, it's only going to be better for that, I think, going forward. Let's move on to that one. Do, 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 do. Okay, what else is next? Okay, so we have some big news in the managerial front. Um, Thomas Tunchul, the PSG manager, has been sacked, um, which is kind of sad for him i guess and again sacked on christmas eve or christmas day depending on where you celebrate stuff is pretty bleak and considering that psg are what third in Liga, and they're still in the champions league they finished top of our group Man united which we got knocked out in right we finished third or fourth whatever it was um it's probably a uh it's probably there's probably some unfortunateness attached to it he's probably a bit unlucky but also, if you read between the lines and you believe the rumors, um, Thomas Tuchel was never Leonardo's guy. I think he came in prior to Leonardo's appointment as the sporting director there at PSG. Um, they also don't get along, which doesn't help. Supposedly, they don't talk. They're not even on speaking terms, which is doesn't make any sense whatsoever, right? Especially in the continent. Um, directors of football are like the middleman for the manager. They're like the person that the manager goes to kind of, you know, as a shoulder to lean on to kind of persuade the board to give him more funds or to maybe, you know, help with the narrative in the press, whatever it may be. But usually there's um, a very uh, cordial, almost cooperative relationship between directors of football, whoever they are, and the managers. Um, the fact that they don't talk to each other is probably a, a, some sending some big alarm bells. And if anything, in Thomas Tuchel's position, 
he probably needed to be undeniable to make sure he doesn't get sacked. He probably needed to win the Champions League last season or look incredibly strong this season, which they did, to be honest, or just be topping the league, uh, you know, by real clear distance margin. But the fact that they've lost a few games in Liga, the fact that they're third at the moment, again, only one point off the top, you know, the league is only, you know, the, it's also, it's kind of been crammed in this year. So there's always a room for a lot of positions to change as the season progress. And you would imagine PSG having the players that they have, they will inevitably climb up in the league. But it does show some ambition, I think, in terms of what PSG are trying to do. Because if, you know, in, in from what we've kind of heard of this new regime, they've essentially bought PSG not just to, you know, be uh, domestic champions because that's always going to happen because they're going to outspend their competition and probably going to hire the best coaches which is inevitably a good recipe to win titles but they wanted to win the biggest one right the one that's going to add real prestige to the PSG name or the PSG brand as the Champions League which has sort of evaded them the last few seasons especially even with the acquisitions of players like Mbappe and Neymar so it makes sense that long term they're probably thinking hey if this guy isn't all immediate they're probably thinking this guy is never going to win the Champions League he'd had a couple of goes at it he hasn't really come close so he needs to make some sort of change and this is news here from sky sports thomas tuchel sacked by paris saint germain it says thomas tuchel has been sacked by the paris saint germain um, according to sky germany tuchel joined the club at the beginning of 2018 2019 season winning back-to-back -back league titles right as well as the cop de france and the cop de league in 2020 so again people like to because not people like to say some people would like to suggest that because Pochino hasn't won anything that it somehow um you know omits him from the conversation to be United coach but then Oligon Solskjaer because he's won back-to-back -back titles at Mulder Norwegian league which is you know I would even say is it in the top five leagues in Europe probably not um that that is somehow makes him a better um, candidate when the reality of it is at the top clubs it's really about uh, what have you done for me lately no one really cares about your past achievements because like I said, he won the league the previous season before last. Then he wins it again and he's still under pressure. He doesn't obviously win the Champions League, so he's still under pressure. He wins, you know, the um I guess the, their version of the FA Cup and the League Cup, and he still doesn't, you know, it still doesn't give him any sort of uh, guarantees or buy him any time for the future. It's what have you done for me lately? So if I didn't this season, some United fans are turning around after United finished trophyless, let's God forbid, but if that happens I think United, some United fans are well within their rights to suggest he should be fired. Especially if we don't win the league and we don't win any cups in the season, that will be a failure. But, in, you know, in other people's eyes, they're just hell-bent on this idea of Oli in, Oli in, which is a really bizarre thing because you'd want the club to be successful, not the, the manager. But, hey, what can you do? Continues. PSG are currently third in Ligue 1, a point behind leaders Lyon, and have lost four of the 17 games this season. They top their group of the Champions League and are ahead of Ripple Leipzig and Manchester United and will face Barcelona in the last 16 competitions. So again, it's a very gutsy, bold move and probably kind of reminds you of what Chelsea used to do back in the day, right? They just sack managers um, left, right and centre when they didn't feel like it was going well. So maybe it's a sign of a top club. Maybe it's a sign of a club doing be a bit knee jerk or maybe it's just a manager who's probably a bit overrated maybe coming to the end of his tenure because i'm i'm a, i'm one of those people that would say um two show is good but not as good as the clubs that he's sort of or not as good as he sort of reputation precedes him i would say in that regard anyway it continues um two show's part uh, yeah comes after four months after he guided the club to the first champions league final where they lost to Bayern munich right the German replaced Una Emery on a two-year contract in June 2018 and signed an extension last May, which would have seen him stay in Paris until the end of the current campaign. Um, however, in October, there was a public fallout over player recruitment with the club sporting director, Leonardo, as I mentioned. Tuchel said, we lose too many players on free transfers. It's too much. We cannot ask the squad and the same thing as we did last season. The following day, Leonardo voices disapproval of Tuchel's comments saying, you have to respect the people above you. I don't like his comments. The club didn't like them either. Jesus Christ. We have to understand the moment we're going through. If someone is not happy, it's easy. We can talk. But if you decide to stay, you have to respect the people above you. They beat Strasbourg 4-0 in the league on Wednesday night and are next in the nation action against Sedentia on January 6th. 
And of course, who will be next manager? We know who that's going to be because it's basically been confirmed. On the next screen here, we have Mauricio Pochettino set to take over at PSG after Thomas Tuchel was sacked. And this is courtesy of Fabrizio Romano. You know, the here we go guy. He says the following. Mauricio Pochettino is set to replace Thomas Tuchel at Paris Saint-Germain head coach in the coming hours after the German was sacked on Thursday with a club that had been champions seven of the past eight seasons sitting third in Ligue 1. Pochettino has reached an agreement with PSG to take over as their new manager with only a few deals to be ironed out before his appointment is confirmed. The Argentinian, who has been out of football since leaving Tottenham in January, sorry, leaving Tottenham in November 2019, is thought to be very keen to take over the Qatar and club. So I guess there are fans like myself who are somewhat disappointed because you would have hoped Pochettino would be managing United. Um, there are obviously fans who, you know, never wanted Pochettino and always wanted the Oli experiment to work. And so far, um, the recent form that we've had, the fact that, you know, even though we've got a lot of Champions League, I think the league form and the cup form and the League Cup has been pretty decent. We're into the semifinals now against Man City. I'm of the assumption or I'm, I'm of the thinking that if they didn't sack him when he got locked out of Champions League, because in some big clubs, that's a sackable offence. If that's not the case, then you just have to stay with him until the end of the season. And I think considering the form that we have now, considering the mood of the club, considering the Pogba situation's kind of been settled for the most part, considering we have um, Amadou Diallo coming in in January, we have this um, Ecuadorian kid who looks very promising, probably going to go out on loan. We have Van der Beek who still needs to kick on in the next year. Um, you know, of course, um, people like Cavani are going to come into a bit, a bit more of match sharpness and fitness in the next few months. It probably He probably does deserve to see out the season at the very least. Now, if the season gets seen now, and, you know, for the most part, we end up trophyless and outside of the top two, top three, whatever, in the Premier League, then it's you're allowed to ask the question if his position should be considered. And I think it should at that case, especially if your long-term goal is to win the Premier League. And I think, unfortunately, for us, we're going to have to gamble the manager because I think the Pochettino experiment wouldn't have been a gamble because you know what you can do in the Premier League. Well, you know, you've seen what you've done at Southampton. You've seen what you've done at Tottenham with, you know, again, with limited resources. And he was able to essentially take Tottenham to the final, which they probably should have won. But still, the fact that he did it with Tottenham was a big achievement. And I think we'll probably see how big of an achievement it, it is because um, in hindsight, or no, yeah, I think we'll, we'll probably see what a big achievement Pochettino did at Tottenham once the Mourinho tenure is over. If Mourinho can't get anything out of this team, if he can't squeeze out one trophy, um, one very high league position finish, then we would know that Pochettino really worked in miracles and his team going forward because I think Mourinho has been given essentially the freedom of of Spurs to do exactly what he pleases to mould the team and the club in his sort of image, which Pochettino got as well, don't get me wrong, but there is an added onus, I feel like, at the boardroom level at Tottenham to give Mourinho whatever he wants to ensure that they get a trophy in that cabinet because it's going to add, again, to their overall brand and what they want to do going in the future. So... I'm disappointed Pochettino's going to PSG, but again, on his side, I can understand it. He's a former player. Um, he's been out of football since 2019, if you believe what Dunga Castle's been saying. He's very antsy about getting back into football now that he's gardening the thing is over because I think Tottenham had a little a clause in the contract that basically meant he couldn't manage until a certain period had run out if he wanted to get a compensation. Now that contract is up, he's obviously able to take jobs now. He just wants to get back involved. You saw his appearance at Sky Sports News out of the blue. It was a bit of a indirect um, hint, hint, and reminder that he's still alive. So I think it's perfectly set up for him. And again, the, the French league isn't the most strenuous league in the world. Um, the fact that you have all the resources will help him. The fact that he's a better coach than a lot of the coaches out there in terms of, you know, I think if you give good coaches who are able to make shit players good, he's going to do wonderful things with very talented players, right? You would assume so. Um, so it's good to see that. Um, but then again, pressure is also going to be on there, on him, because you're at, you know, you're at PSG. You, you're kind of expected to win the league with finishing seconds of failure, right? You even saw it. Um, Thomas Tuchel went back-to-back -back league titles and he still got fired even though he essentially knocked out United from that Champions League group. So there is a lot of pressure at, at, at PSG and it seems like if he doesn't win the Champions League, it'll be a failure. 
as well at, at PSG. I think personally it'll be a success because at least you'll be able to shut up the haters with the whole no, no no trophy. But in terms of his tenure and his sort of legacy at PSG, he will need to win a Champions League to make that era or to make that tenure, um, you know, make sense or to live long in the memory and to justify position, justify his reputation in football in general going forward. But it's a very odd situation, I think, because um, if you're a United fan, you'd be like, why do we have to be reactive? Why do we have to wait for us to like be in the outside the top four, knocked out of the Champions League, playing very poorly, uh, players clearly not playing for the coach, for us to then make a change as a, for as a manager? Why can't we just make it? Um, of course, it's never going to happen with United because, again, I think we have to recognise that um, there's a lot of people that are going to be to blame for it if Solskjaer does you know, gets fired. Edward Wood's going to be under the microscope again. The Glades are going to be under the microscope again. They don't want that attention. So they'd much rather, you know, l let him stay in front of the cameras. Obviously, the results are beneficial. So they're insulating the people at the boardroom some level. But I'm hoping this recent form isn't going to um, take our eyes away from the prize and isn't going to make people think that we don't need a sporting director. We don't need, um, you know, Edward to get out of the footballing decisions. We don't need maybe to relook at how coaching staff is set up, our injury prevention team, whatever it may be. There's things that we need to look at as a team overall, our player recruitment that needs to be definitely looked at that I'd hope that this recent form isn't going to somehow distract us from. Um, da, 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 da. it continues here so it says uh, Tunisia will pay the price for a slow start in Liga, where PSG have four defeats in the first 17 games and are a point behind Lyon the leaders and Lille the 47 year old departs after a 4-0 home win over Strasbourg. so over the weekend he won 4-0 and he still gets sacked on Christmas Eve on Wednesday with PSG points director Leonardo first sounding out Pochettino representative early this week in his post match press conference on Wednesday Tunisia addressed comments made in an interview in German TV Sport 1 he said um, Tuchel was quite as saying he felt more like a sports politician than a coach in his first year at PSG but insisted that the quote was an accurate translation of a light-hearted comment the former Dortmund manager was appointed head coach at Parc de Prince in June 18th replacing Unai Emery Tuchel won the league titles in France completing domestic treble last season and in August this year he led PSG to their first ever Champions League final which they lost 1-0 to Bayern Munich again pretty decent uh, CV and record of course maybe as a team they don't play that great football team selection substitutions um, player acquisitions have been a bit terrible going forward but it's not like he's a bum you know so interested to see what's going to happen going forward um, it, it seems like you know we're going to have to you know through richer or poorer we're going to have to just stick with Oli for the long long term I think unless is I think unless we end up in an Arsenal relegation scrap there's no point there's no way I see us ever sacking Oli on social I think now with this news which again I think is both beneficial for the club and maybe for him personally as a manager but I think it's also concerning that we are kind of placing all our faith again in one coach and not creating a structure around him that's going to allow anyone to succeed because when he leaves you know you'd, you'd hope we'd have football directors in place before the, his tenure comes to an end so that when you do hire somebody else we have a structure and a system in place that they can succeed in whereas if Solskjaer leaves now what do we do then we start again from scratch you know what I mean that's the issue that we have here going forward so it's less about an Oli situation so it's about Oli and it's more so about the club overall and the fan base like you know lowering of expectations and just a lack of willingness to do what's needed in order to kind of get to the top that ruthless edge we don't seem to have it as these other big clubs do that's the thing that i'm kind of spotting here going forward um but hey and again you know Michel Pochettino has been sounded out by United if you you know the, you can like what you you can like it or not but there were when Solskjaer was going through that tough period or we were going through a tough period of form um you know in the middle of the or beginning of the season there were suggestions that Pochettino was being um sounded out would he like to manage United right now he's obviously going to maybe take over at PSG that's the sort of stature or caliber of manager that he's um playing or that's the level that he's sort of managing at clubs at those levels are coming to him and saying hey we want you to manage our club the question is for the Oli Oli in crowd what sort of level club would Oli get once he gets fired or leaves United what level do you think he's going to go at will it be in the Premier League even I don't know we'll have to wait and see next on the list 
What else do we have? Oh, we have some good news. Playboy Carti has finally announced a release date for his album. It's going to come out tomorrow, actually. Um, and it's actually coming out now. We have merch. We have a website. We have a digital download for the album. You can pre-order ahead of time. It's actually coming out. So it's been turned in. Whatever is in the system that's due to come out one minute after 12 is what we're going to get. And I cannot be more excited, man. Um, Dialit was one of my you know, most played albums in the last few years, maybe up there with um, Dirty Sprite 2 from Future. So much replay value, something that easily, because the, the thing I like about both albums, um, from the Dialit, from Playboy Kai, and of course DS2 from Future, is that they're the perfect length for like a really intense gym session. Like, this is the thing that I always listen to when I want to just get really crunk and really go for it. Um, when I'm in the gym, when I'm on a run. And they're, um, and then again, at home, sonically, they just flow so effortlessly well. And I think most of him played by Kai's um, side of things. I think he's sort of aloofness and he's reluctance aloofness and reluctance reluctancy or reluctance or whatever that word is right to put out albums on a consistent basis when he says he's going to put them out um has inevitably helped him because i don't think there's anyone else in hip-hop who sounds like him or who can do what he does on songs he's got such a unique voice and i think when he was around more and he was putting out more singles he was putting out he was on more features you could sometimes get a bit confused as to who the actual goat was who the actual top dog was in the in that kind of realm of whatever rapping style that he does and he definitely is up there with the Louis Uzi verse the instant probably one and two or a and b depending on your taste um they are miles ahead of anybody else um even the likes of like a trippy red who i'm a big fan of right he's definitely a couple of tiers or a tier below those two those two guys in their ability to craft songs and their ability to make moments and their ability to um you know um just go viral and all this sort of stuff like they are in, in just a category on their own and i think this absence has definitely helped um carty with that um the album cover itself is um inspired by a slash it's an old school punk fanzine so you know where that energy is coming from which makes sense considering his new like sort of like what they call him a uh, gay vampire vibe that he has going on at the moment um i love it i probably would love it to have a bit more of a gradient when it comes to the actual finish itself but i love the artistic nature the approach that's gone with it again i'm always a big believer in um albums inform albums should give you an album cover should give you an idea on the quality of music you're going to be listening to i think if the artist takes the time to really dig deep and have the artwork somehow reflect the music or have the music influence the artwork wherever it happens i do think the level of quality of work is going to be better when it's just like a hap dash slap you know a hap dash really put together last minute.com poorly done photoshop job then you know more than likely than not it's just a collection of songs that were finished on the hard drive that all got put and compiled into one album and that was it but i think we're going to get a lot more than that from Kai again in typical Kai form we got no track list we have no idea who's going to be on it officially maybe Kid Cudi and Future I think he mentioned he shouted him out supposedly Lil Uzi Vert said on some random person's Instagram live he's going to be on two tracks but I think he was just trolling so I like that approach from him it's a bit odd that it doesn't ever leak prior because I think you'd get the feeling nowadays that there's always somebody in the supply chain who's going to be tempted to sort of just leak stuff just so they can be the person that did it. But I guess it's testament to his level of artistry that he's able to not have that happen because there's not a lot of people that do that, right? Maybe Beyonce's and Rihanna's, the Frank Ocean's, even Drake doesn't have that luxury. His stuff always, or maybe not not the music itself, but the track listing and who's on it, it always leaks out beforehand. But somehow Playboy Kai has been able to sort of keep this stuff close to his chest. And again, it's Thursday now. We have no idea who's going to be on the album, what the track listing is. Um, maybe we have an idea on the track list based on the merch, um, which a lot of people have a lot of things to say about which I'm, again, I'm not that bothered about, to be honest, because, you know, I buy a lot of heavy metal band merch myself, so I'm very familiar with the questionable graphics, especially if you have a religious background. But, you know, maybe you can get some of the track names, be uh, the names on the, or be the, the sort of names that are on the merch pieces. But again, you'll be guessing. You'd have no idea what exactly they are. So I kind of love that about him in that regard. I love that, you know, we have no idea what the listing is going to be. But we're all kind of an eagerly anticipating his release. And 
we kind of saw a different change in how Playboy Carter has been approaching stuff just based on his Instagram alone. I've never seen him this active, right? I think what from, we'll say from about here, was it here or there? We basically saw an uptick and this was when 1.2 million plays or likes it says here, right? This is from when, da, 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 let's load up a little bit. It's taking ages. This is from November 23rd. I even liked it. So this was definitely a, a calculated effort to ramp up the, kind of noise on the album now I wonder if it feels rushed to release at the end of the year if this was always a plan um i know a lot of the bigger artists who kind of play well live who tour well don't get me wrong were kind of reluctant to put out albums because they couldn't necessarily tour so it didn't make no sense but i think the the longer the pandemic has gone on i think the more people have sort of understood the need to put out some level of content for your fans to consume during the year to kind of keep your name relevant in some respects it shouldn't really matter if you're an actual artist because you know what is relevancy um if you're fearing apple do you know what i mean you're just you just make good music your fans always love you and then when you drop you drop in it so i think playboy kai and these people should be in that same sort of mindset or are definitely operating that same sort of way but it definitely does help if you're able to sort of put yourself into the consciousness of people whilst they're going through this difficult time and then boom when things open up you're right back on it again so that was definitely interesting to see he even posted a picture of his kid do you know what i mean and we didn't see this we didn't know this baby was alive for a while in it and was calling what do you call him onyx or something oh Gil, gilbert that's what gilbert right? <laughs> so that was definitely an indication of just how much of just how um serious he was about releasing the album finally because you know we've had many false starts stops and starts here and there but it's great to see this finally coming out and of course you've got a picture here of him and kid cuddy so that should be releasing tomorrow um december 25th so definitely looking forward to that one and of course it should be um it should be a, again expectation wise i don't know I'm, I'm not really i'm not waiting for a classic i just want to hear what he sort of sounds like sonically two years on that's basically i kind of enjoy hearing the evolution and hearing how it's like gucci main right like it's quite interesting to go back to his mixtapes and then hear what he sounds like now even if you didn't know you know about what he went through and how he sort of changed around changed his life around with you know being healthy and staying off the drugs and working out but you can definitely tell it's an evolution as a change he sort of got better as an artist he sort of um enunciates way better everything's just improved and i guess some artists like playboy Hardy, like a tyler the creator i'm not really looking for classic albums i just want to hear what they've been what sort of musical inspiration they sort of gathered up in the last two years to kind of show them show us like oh what have you been up to what sort of things have you listened to what life experiences have you gone through like, like give us an insight um and that'll be cool because you know he really does interviews really really does anything else apart from just posing you know bits of rick owens or whatever it may be but i'll be interested to see how that um evolves as we continue um again coming up very very soon that jacket is so underrated that's the Montclair and Rick Owens jacket the silver one I don't know I've got a thing with silver jackets too I think a baby and ape made one back in the day that was very popular oh no that that kind of split the opinion of people actually and um, it's funny what how what happens and you you just you make that coat in another color and all of a sudden no one cares but the moment you make it in silver or gold everyone's got a thing to say about it it's very or interesting when it comes to coats i'm not too sure why that's the case i think this was him hanging out with um kanye of course showing us all his vehicles but yeah let's see hopefully we see that very very soon um i cannot wait hopefully you don't get a last minute um delay as well that'll be that'll be hurtful hope it doesn't happen hopefully that does not happen next on the list uh -huh. what else we have here oh yeah we have this one this is a bit interesting isn't it a bit weird and funny supposedly it's not a troll um, KFC launches a video game console with a red hot fried chicken grill. Honestly, one of the most bizarre things I've seen, but I think because I've um, um, digested a lot of Gary V's content, I should not be that surprised. I remember him mentioning once on one video where he said um, companies like BMW should look into, you know, making a uh, esports team making branded products and really taking it seriously because i think he was saying that these brands they underestimate the appeal that they have and the amount of pull and the amount that any amount that their customers are willing to pay for or buy whatever products they make outside of their kind of core products so i was like huh so he's like something you know, suggesting like you know ford make umbrellas or i don't know a bicycle whatever it may be 
but they'll be surprised at the reaction that they would get from the actual fan base. And I was thinking, hmm, that's true. But I was, but then how far does this KFC console go? Do eaters of KFC really want to buy a console from them? Do you associate KFC with computer games in any way or video games in any way possible? Or, or is this just a clever marketing gimmick to essentially you know organically get some much needed traffic online have people talking about the brand and just have a little bit of novelty during the year that you know has been a bit tough and people have been going through whatever they've been going through it's nice to kind of put a smile on people's faces i don't know but regardless i think it's hilarious so it's from the new yorker it says kfc has devised a way for hungry gamers to reheat their chicken without having to press pause by launching a finger licking video game console with a built-in grill the kfc console has arrived and announced manufacturer call and master on their website kfc originally posted a video on the kfc console following the june te- debut of PlayStation 5 in which they boasted that the contraption was equipped with a red hot grill however gamers thought the manufactured machine was a goof until the makers clarified it was in fact the real deal on Tuesday they said yes it's real tweeted um, <laughs> representative Mark Walton he says yes this is powered by um, Intel and yes it has a chicken warmer KFC Gaming even released an epic video showcasing it, it says watch a little bit of the video here this is absolutely insane There's a reason mankind didn't peak with the discovery of fire, or the invention of the wheel. (laughs) It's a feeling inside all of us that compels us to go further. Makes no sense. Reach higher, and dream of ways to achieve the unachievable. When the odds are stacked against us, and it seems like it it reminds me of like a perfume commercial. Tell us no. That's not possible. Surely that can't be done. And we look up to the stars and say, just watch me. Because we know that rules are made to be broken. We know that dreams are made to be followed. That the impossible is made to be possible. (laughs) And that gaming consoles are made to evolve. (laughs) Welcome to the next level in gaming innovation. The KF Console. That's pretty smart because you think there's definitely, I guess, a demand for people because what do people do usually when they get all the KFC? Do you chuck it on the microwave usually, right? Or sometimes you want to maybe put it in the oven so you can get retain that sort of crispy uh, feel. So I definitely think they've um, tapped into a need from the gaming community where, you know, you order something from Deliveroo, but you're so engrossed in your computer game, you forget you've ordered it, or you're just taking little bites as you're playing, you don't want to eat on the microphone, blah, 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 blah. So a great way to sort of just be able to play and continue to eat your stuff at the adequate temperature is to have this sort of game you did think again i can't be able to talk about it seriously but this is interesting and funny to see the things that some companies are willing to do in order just to keep them names in the public conversation um and i guess this this is the best way possible i think i, I don't like those sort of like um empty um you know performative sort of like acts of charity that don't really go anywhere if you're gonna be if you're gonna if you want to reinsert yourself again in the public conversation during a tough year without coming across you know a little bit disingenuous this is the best way to do it continues here the quote it says utilizing the system's natural uh, heat and airflow you can now focus on your gameplay and enjoy hot crispy chicken between rounds um, it is. It, it wasn't um, nifty enough. The device also offers a smooth and fluid high re- frame rate gameplay up to 240 FPS for all games with support for 240 hertz output on 4K displays. Unfortunately, KFC is yet to announce when or where the console will be available. Gamers can state their KFC related pixel pangs in the interim by playing the I Love You <laughs> Colonel Sanders dating simulator or building a KFC restaurant in Minecraft. But yeah, let's see. It's not no date yet so far. I guess we have to wait for an MKBHD review to actually know it's actually real. But so far, they've told us it's real. They've given us an epic video. Um, so we cannot doubt them. We cannot doubt them. But yeah, jokes, man. Absolute jokes when it comes to that, innit? Absolute jokes. What else is going on here? Boom, 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 boom. Oh man, it's gonna play automatically. I hate automatic videos. Okay, let's go back. Cool. Oh, for fuck's sake. Okay, there we go. Go back. 
Oh my god, these all make videos on websites are honestly the worst thing in the world. It's like pure hell. Anyway, let's continue. So next on the list, we have this. If I can just get all this stuff off the oh my god, this website is so horrible. So this is courtesy of Reuters. <laughs> Exclusive Apple targets car production by 2024 and eyes the next level battery technology sources say. So this came out of kind of nowhere, I think, for most people. Um news kind of got leaked via a journalist that Apple were working on an Apple electric car. Um, I think we've sort of heard rumors of this in prior years, but nothing actually happened. I think they even put together a little team and hired and fired a bunch of people. But so far, um, we've not really seen anything tangible that will lead us to believe that Apple are really being serious about it. But so, but this news um, has definitely kind of um, woken people up to the fact that we might see an Apple car sometime in the future, considering um, that they would want to place this very well-intended leaked story in Reuters so it continues so the Apple Inc is moving forward with a self-driving um, car technology that is targeting 2024 to produce a passenger vehicle that could include its own breakthrough battery technology people familiar with the matter told Reuters um, the iPhone manufacturer's automotive efforts known as Project Titan have produced unevenly um, since 2014 when it first started to begin or to design sorry, its own vehicle from scratch. At one point, Apple drew back its effort to focus on the software and reassessed its goals. Doug Field, an Apple veteran who had worked at Apple, at Tesla, sorry, returned to oversee the project in 2018 and laid off 190 people from the team in 2019. Since then, Apple has progressed enough that it now aims to build a vehicle for the consumers. Two people familiar with the effort said, asking not to be named because Apple's plans are not public. Apple's goal of the building the personal vehicle for the mass market contrasts its rivals such as Alphabet's Inc. Waymo, which has built robo taxis for to carry passengers for driverless ride hauling services. Central to Apple's strategy is a new battery design that could radically reduce the cost of batteries and increase the vehicle's range, according to a third person who's been Apple's battery design. Uh, yeah, we've seen a battery design. Apple declined to comment on its plans and future products. So, again, very interesting. I think. This is always going to be on the cards. And I think if you're going to be Apple and you're coming into this market, especially with Tesla, especially considering they have like, what, 10 years um, or maybe less than that. I'm not too sure. But they have a lot of years of experience and development in the electronic um, or in the electric car market. So if you're going to come in, you're going to have to come in and offer something that they're not be able to offer. So one of the big sticking points, one of the things they always kind of brag about at Tesla uh, presentation for new models is the improvements on range. It's been something, I guess, that's kind of been a stumbling block for most electric cars and something that Apple have kind of, or sorry, Tesla have sort of perfected over the years, but it's very difficult to get more mileage out of the current battery cells that are sort of available at the moment they've sort of changed the configuration on Tesla now at the moment where they are they've obviously upgraded some of the cells but for the most part it kind of is at a certain limit so if Apple could come in and sort of really explode that and sort of double triple it by a really considerable amount I'm sure it will appeal to some consumers and again it just makes complete sense for me when I think about you know that time when Apple took um, the ability to make because I think now it's different now you have the ability to set Google Maps as your default but for a moment in time um, Apple did uh, prioritize its own maps um, as or its own native maps as the apps that they wanted people to use and then they sort of kind of relegated um, the Google Maps to just being another app on your phone so that would obviously lead you to believe that there was definitely something in place there with the stuff that they're doing with Waymo they want to gather more data obviously for people using the app along uh, all the time when they're out and about and stuff so that would make more sense and we've obviously seen with the Apple AirPod Maxes that they kind of pushing or pulling away into different areas of that regard of course with the iPhone itself you know it could definitely envision the future where you're able to start your Apple car just by having your phone in your pocket I know Tesla do a similar thing, but they have like a card that you put in your wallet. But imagine your your key is actually just your phone that you already use, which is a, a, an app that they just update over time. You know, you send over the uh, update, same as they do as Tesla. There's definitely a lot of scope. You can definitely see that Apple have all the tools necessary and resources to make this a success. And of course, I'm more interested to see I think the technology will be obviously advanced. We know that for sure. Um, and the engineering of it will be out of this world. But in terms of just look, aesthetics, I'm interested to see what happens there because I have a really strange feeling that if they get this right and if they're able to kind of 
collectively changes everybody's attitude towards electric cars i could see the design of it alone influencing many cars to come the same way that the actual iphone itself influenced smartphones right before the apple iphone came along um smartphones didn't look like the way that they do when apple made them they didn't they weren't rectangular they weren't thin they didn't have no actual keyboards and it wasn't all touch screen with your actual fingers um that wasn't a thing that was done but as soon as they did it everyone sort of copied that sort of um that approach to design so if apple are able to you know in my for my own appeal if they're able to kind of produce a car that looks like a concept car it looks flipping crazy it looks nuts it's got this you know weird windshield lights you know um just looks incredible it's like nothing else you see in the road i do think it's going to inform a lot of um car manufacturers or it's going to put more pressure on them to try and release those cars that we see presented at automobile shows that never get you know made into roadworthy vehicles it's always the most they, they just take the technology that they like from it strip it back and put it into a really regular shell but you want to see some of that kind of crazy you know is that that car that drake drives in um the video um with little Dirk, right? That's like a concept car that he's driving, right? It'd be cool to see that sort of stuff applied um, to cars in general going forward, whether they're electric or not. It says here, um, making a vehicle represents a supply chain challenge, even for Apple, a company with deep pockets that makes hundreds of millions of electronic products for each year with parts from around the world, but has never made a new car. Uh, it took Elon Musk Tesla's um, 17 years, so even more than 10 that I, that I described, before it fully turned a sustainable profit making cars. Quote here. If there is one company on a planet that has the resources to do that, it's probably Apple. But at the same time, it's not a cell phone, said the person who worked at the Project Titan. I definitely agree with that one. Um, it remains unclear who would assemble any um, Apple-branded car, but sources said they expected the company to rely on a manufacturing partner to build vehicles. And there is still a chance that Apple will decide to reduce the scope of its efforts to an autonomous driving system that will be integrated with a car made by a traditional automator. That's, that's an interesting approach, but I would much prefer uh, just a, you know, a, a car coming from Apple as opposed to them just slapping their logo on one that's already been made for another company, similar to what they, they do now with the uh, what you call it with a google phone um da, 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 da. two people with knowledge of the apple's plans warn pandemic related delays could push the start of production into 2025 which makes sense shares of tesla ended at 6.5 low on monday after the debut of smp 500 on monday um apple shares ended at 1.4 percent apple has decided to tap outside you know, partners for elements of the system including a lidar sensor which helped self-driving cars get a three-dimensional view of the road two people familiar with the company have said interesting that they're approaching lidar i know that lidar Elon Musk isn't a fan of. I know that LiDAR is being used now at the moment um, for uh, archaeology reasons, right? You're able to essentially scan large swaths of land and kind of look at anomalies on the surface underneath. And, you know, they, they've discovered like pyramids and all this sort of mad stuff using LiDAR. So it's interesting to see how they go with that. It continues. Apple's car might feature multiple LiDAR sensors for scanning different distances. Another person said some sensors should be could be deprived could be derived from Apple's internally developed LiDAR units. That person said Apple iPhones 12 Pro and Pro models are released this year both feature LiDAR sensors. Reuters previously reported that Apple had held talks with potential LiDAR suppliers, but it was also examining building its own sensors. That is insane, isn't it? So let's see if that happens. Um, sorry there from Reuters. Interested to see how that develops in the coming years, but definitely something that makes complete sense considering what a beast Apple is as a company. The fact that they're you know immensely cash rich, and the fact that automotive design outside of you know people like Tesla has sort of been a bit stagnant over the last few years. It'd be nice to see um, Apple come in and kick their butt somewhat. And again, even just even just like sell wise, like where would they sell these things, right? Would they build their own kind of fleet of showrooms, which I imagine they would because they want to present it in a certain way? or would they partner up with car dealerships around the world that would be just to see how they roll it out and just the ease of which people could buy them the price point at the moment now still what's the cheapest electric car at the moment maybe like a prius is that cheaper than a tesla i imagine it is and that's not even fully electric right that's like half and half but they're not cheap so obviously i guess long term 
they're kind of cost effective but in terms of people that be able to but again apple is not mr cheap is it themselves but let's see what they do let's say interested to see will they roll out one car will there be two cars will it be um you know a affordable quote-unquote price range or will it just be them coming in at the high end and then kind of iterating down i would love to see as it develops next on the list we have some interesting news regarding jerry lorenzo um in something that i don't think many people expected it kind of came out of the blue especially considering the brand um he has signed a long-term partnership with adidas um he's got a pretty um epic you know uh portrait pictures taken of him here on the on high beast you know one of course of him looking like a streetwear jesus and another one where they what looks like i'm hoping is a temporary tattoo of the three stripes emblazoned on the back of his neck <laughs> but regardless it says the following in an, in an unexpected bit of pre-holiday news fear of god and adidas um have announced a long-term partnership the partnership will be centered around two main pillars fear of god jerry lorenzo driving global creative and business strategy for basketball and a creation of a new fear of god athletic sub label company the brand's essentials collections and mainline offerings hold on uh fear of god athletics sub label to a company oh that's amazing i'm um, interested though because i think a lot of people have a lot of bad things to say about the essentials line that um kind of uh jerry has done and i remember him saying something along the lines of i think it's ages ago because i'm a big I'm a I'm a big fan of diffusion labels, maybe because of Mark Jacobs. I think he had probably some of the best diffusion lines ever existed. Of course, some of the best names for them, right? Mark by Mark, Mark by Mark, 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 Mark like epic. Um, and I also like when they kind of take a fun approach to them designers instead of instead of kind of see it as a devaluing of their work they sort of see their diffusion line as a way to kind of you know be a bit more experimental maybe you know uh, try and target a different demographic a different age range i like that sort of like i like the idea conceptually and the kind of challenge it poses for a designer to sort of like you know be able to uh, apply their creative skills to um a level of design that they're probably not that familiar with or to a appeal to a group of people that they probably don't design um in mind of in that certain extent but i think it's definitely a good marriage to line them up with the athletics with stuff they're doing adidas because the only people you see wearing essentials are you know young adults or kids who are kind of you know into the sportswear so it can make complete sense to sort of marry up with basketball stuff because you know if you make good sportswear in general that is also sport specific and can actually work and people are going to buy it as well like normal punters so that makes complete sense and the fact that he's got two gigs there he's cashing out you can just imagine what that salary is going to be like in it that's a good good gig for him it continues here adding lorendo lorenzo street meets luxury meets sport design ethos to a basketball label that boasts global stars like james harden Damien uh, damian lilliard and donovan mitchell is a step in a bold new direction for adidas and fog alike quote this is a fearless move we sh uh, where shared vision and conviction are at the heart of the create assertion of two brands shaping sports and culture with the purpose to truly multiply our nuanced strengths to revolutionize the performance of basketball industry forever said lorenzo what did he did he put that in some sort of marketing um speak generator that sounds epic, isn't it? <laughs> um, it continues to say, ADS and Fear of God share the same dream for the future of basketball on and off the court, and we look forward to changing the face of the industry for a new model that will unfold before us in the coming years. That's awesome to see. Um, again, I think what you've seen so far from um, Jerry, especially with his color labs, when he's given the kind of license to be to do what he wants, especially the Nike stuff, right? He could have easily just made an Air Force One, um, but the fact that he made his own shoe, the fact that he kind of you know went as far as bringing his own bloody last from italy to use as a tooling for the shoe itself the fact that it looked exactly like the stuff that he's made in his own collections it kind of it, it's sort of like linked up to stuff that he already does i think could definitely make you confident that once he gets access to the archives because you know i think ILS is definitely one of the most untapped resources in terms of um, what they have in their actual archive, the actual brands they have under their umbrella, the people that have worked there prior. There's lots of references to pull from. Um, you know, you look at stuff like, I don't know, where's the last good basketball shoe that I've seen recently? ILS have got like a street ball shoe or something. Is it street ball or something like that? One of them kind of shoes. It kind of looks like a Y3. But even look at the stuff that they have at the Y3 um, division of Adidas. There's loads of stuff to kind of pull from that I think he can definitely um, build upon going forward. 
uh, it says yeah though fear of god athletics um forthcoming products are yet to be revealed it's set to be centered around performance basketball and active wear products contrasting with essentials cozy staples and fog's mainline modernized takes on suiting and workwear it's quite possible that the collaborative products with the athletes mentioned above will appear as well of course um, this announcement marks the end of lorenzo's time with nike a relationship that began in 2018 and was known for footwear to the race at the field god once yeah that's interesting isn't it because uh, you you did get the feeling that he was more of a nike guy than a adidas dude but I also do like the idea that he's able to kind of jump between the brands. I think that's something that you don't see often enough. I think nowadays the kids are way too obsessed with being like one brand whores and stuff. And I much prefer the kind of example of people who have come prior to us in the scene, who have kind of been able to work with different brands, been able to kind of move freely um, or on different projects. And that is essentially served their, what they're doing better. And of course, provided us, the consumers, with far better products and far more range than just the same old derivative stuff being made by the same people because they're in bed with the same companies because they send them free shoes it's better to kind of you know evolve and continue on um and again many more opportunities i'm assuming with adidas i'm assuming you know there's not probably a lot of room we've had the same story from loads of creatives from kanye west all the way down with you know how kind of limiting and i won't say limited how kind of yeah, I would say somewhat limiting it is to work with Nike in the collaborate in the collaborative sense of the word, especially when you want to make a uh, bigger range of products. You want to maybe have a more long lasting partnership. Um, again, it's a it's a probably a big loss for them going forward. It's probably one of the four horsemen of the school of Kanye that have kind of left there, right? So far, we've still got what we still got. They still got Virgil, we've still got Matthew, we've still got Heron, but um, it's definitely a big one that they've kind of lost in that respect. So interesting to see who they end up replacing with, because I'm sure. Nike aren't going to take this well right they're not going to take this um lying down they're definitely going to go out there and get somebody else to kind of tap into with so let's see maybe a Shane Gonzalez um official partnership maybe the dude that does the 424 store right with the long hair he might be the next guy that comes forward and steps up there or maybe even somebody like a um like a Sammy Ross that might be a good option um it continues here, it says the global impact that Jay Lorenzo and Fear of God has had on the culture and the industry is undeniable, said the Adidas executive Brian Greavy. Jerry is a creative visionary and embodies a true um, expression of the entrepreneurial spirit today. His authentic connection to sport, deep understanding of the football industry and the past and the ability to interpret heritage and visualize the future excites us. We look forward to working with him to inspire the next generation of basketball creatives, athletes and communities. Expect the partnership products to begin to roll out 2021. So this has been in the works for a while then it seems like behind the scenes if they're going to put out the first products next year. He was definitely working on this whilst he was at Con the contract at Nike I'm assuming but do your thing and get your money. But I'm going to get to see him. I'm interested to see it. I think it's going to be a good thing. Again, I, I like what he does outside of clothing too. He always has a bit of a community, family orientated, you know, aspect or outlook on things. Um, I think that's going to be pretty cool to see how he ends up kind of, you know, navigating that regard, who he uses models, what sort of messaging is behind the products. Um, aesthetically, it's going to be perfect. If you've seen the, you know, the, the recent is it pre full collection from Fog, you've seen the, you know, the refinement and the evolution and the just general laser sharp focus that he has on his product now going forward. I think we're going to get the best. I think it's probably the best thing that's happened now for Jerry prior. Then it happened prior when he was wearing white freeze. Remember when he was always wearing those black and white um, flipping Adidas white freeze. I wonder how much he contributed to sell those trainers. I wonder. He probably had a hand in selling a lot of those pairs of shoes. And um, and that, that wasn't, you know, he wasn't even signed to Adidas then. I'm sure he just purchased them himself. So I think... I still think it's a perfect time for him to get the gig now than for him to have got it back then. He's definitely um, a far more um, accomplished, you know, businessman and designer than, than he was back then. And he just, just then definitely has more to say um, and more of a refined vision. So I'm, again, eager to see how that um, evolves as we go forward. But yeah, expect some new products 2021, according to Hypebeast. So you'll see what happens going forward next on the list what else we have here oh we have this interesting piece of news just pause this pause it 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 okay cool so we have this let's finish with this let's get up here it's not working come on let's load this computer so slow there we go i think you probably see how it is 
let's pause that so i'm sure most of you have heard this already but let's pause that and hopefully hope it works my computer's being super slow today maybe because everyone's on the internet because it's you know christmas eve but who knows but regardless we move we move we move bear me one second as this loads as this loads and takes its time cool so as most of you guys are aware i've been um covering entirely you know the situation that's been occurring with some of these la comedians and the you know um rampant sexual assault allegations a lot of them have some more serious than the others and um it's so far i think what's been more than six months since the original crystalia story um was published in the los angeles times off the back of an allegation that a young lady had on social media about chris being inappropriate blah 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 blah. the outrage ensues he immediately probably gets cancelled pulled off of everything on the streaming platforms and essentially um kind of left and abandoned by his friends in the comedy scene now for a fan like myself it was a bit disconcerting to view like jesus christ and i thought you guys were all friends and suddenly you know no one's kind of giving a shit about anybody but it did raise some interesting conversations about how you are meant to deal with it if you're actually going for, if how you're meant to deal with it if you're a colleague or a peer of crystal isn't it are you meant to kind of get in front of the situation and defend him even though he's not defending himself to a really stringent you know in in you know in a normal way or do you just kind of wait to see how things play out in general now obviously on this channel i've kind of made my position clear i think a lot of the his quote-unquote friends essentially ditched him and didn't give him any um opportunity for recourse they didn't provide him with a platform to kind of speak his say his piece or even just use their platform to kind of speak for him and i felt like the, especially when you looked at the allegations a bit deeper and you actually read between the lines and you kind of looked at some of the other corroborating stories a common theme and a common pattern that did evolve from those or narrative that you can kind of glean was that he was a bit of a bad dude and um, he probably did um exp i won't say probably did take advantage of his position i won't say exploited him because i'd say a lot of the women most of them were knowing knowingly got into communication with him knowing kind of what his intentions were but i would say he kind of took advantage of it i would say he probably was a bit naive obviously with the wife and child at home you shouldn't be doing anything anyway but if he did i think the fact that he was actively trying to pursue anything that moved whenever he was another city on the road whenever he got like a you know a compliment from somebody online he'd kind of signed their dms the messages with the underage girl and then he kind of ran away and then when she turned 18 he came back again there was some really sussy stuff going on there right some kind of quintessential um definition um of creep behavior but to say he's a pedophile i've always thought that was a bit excessive especially when people were kind of using the fact that he was on you um playing a pedophile the fact that he might have made some you know some weird comments on his podcast trying to be funny um the fact that he tried, he likes young girls which is not a shock considering he's a you know entertainment person and he lives in hollywood there's loads of other dudes in the same position as him probably older that have gone after way younger girls that shouldn't be that much of a problem i think we're very aware that you know men sometimes do like younger ladies and younger ladies sometimes like older more accomplished men that shouldn't be an issue but i think his position regarding the optics of everything and the fact that he had a bit of a i think i think that really hurt him was the fact that he has had a very clean sort of like cookie cutter image even though he's not a clean comic but he did kind of have that sort of like um harmless sort of appeal to him so to start, just kind of see him creeping on girls on the dms being conniving and devious you know setting up a snapchat it kind of did kind of you know um throw you for a loop uh, but again the more concerning thing i think overall was just the reaction of his friends right the people that have benefited the most from him being in the comedy scene the ones who got millions of views by putting them in his platform the ones who you know most of these people were speaking about him being a killer and a beast the things the ones that people were kind of championing as soon as he got involved in any kind of trouble any kind of um scandal they were quick to scamper away now again if this was a really serious allegation and the, the evidence was very damning then i can definitely understand but i think when you dug the a bit deeper and he just took a bit of a breath step back a bit and looked at what the actual story was it's just a dude being a creep now if you don't want to be his friend because you're not comfortable with him doing that fair enough but the fact that they all kind of um by their actions right sort of uh made it valid that whole 
paedophile allegation. It kind of made me feel a bit of a way. So um, not a lot of them have been speaking about him since, I guess. He's kind of disappeared from the public conversation. He's no longer alive. He doesn't really update his podcast. We don't really had anything from his openers and all that malarkey. Um, his closest Hollywood friends have kind of, you know, essentially decided not to speak about him. Joe Rogan's not uttered his name ever since, I think, with the exception of maybe a couple of times. But um, we don't really hear much from him. But it's good to sometimes hear from the people in the scene in general in terms of how they've been able to deal with it and not deal with it. And one of those is Andrew Schultz and um, on the Tiger Belly podcast. This is a recent one, 227 or 277, sorry, where he's promoting his own special on Netflix, which is out at the moment. So definitely check that one out. But they speak a little bit about um, how they basically dealt with Chris Lee's allegations and how they felt they might have been able to do things differently going forward. But some interesting points being raised here. So I'll play a bit of the clip for you now. They, they, they teach. Oh, there you go. Come on, play. Their dog, they discipline Wasabi. They do all the. <laughs> he has one. It's all her, by the way. She's amazing with Wasabi. I literally just go to the studio all day, and I come back, and I just walk Wasabi at like midnight. Yeah. So, and that yeah. is my contribution. So, if the dog is well trained, it's it's all her. Okay, here it comes. How, how did you feel when when you were in New York when um, some of these comics were going down? Uh, dude, it was wild because your whole scene just got shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. It was like one was after another. It was unbelievable. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And it at first I was like, is this some revenge of the nerds shit? Like, because <laughs> that's what I thought, right? Yeah, it was yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, the cool guys had their run. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, like, it, it almost se dude, it seemed like it was like a, a targeted hit. That's what it felt like. You know, some of the people that were brought down were close friends of mine. Yeah. I, I agree with that. I think at the time, a lot of us did think that. I think there was this theory that, you know, because Joe has signed the Spotify deal, people are upset. They were kind of a concentrated effort to sort of get everyone cancelled. And as well, I don't know, it never really transpired, but we never really heard anything. But there was a time prior to Joey Diaz leaving LA and going back to New York or New Jersey, sorry, where he mentioned that there was a Los Angeles Times journalist or some journalist that was out there fishing for stories. They were calling you know um comedy clubs in the california area and basically trying to glean stories about who were you know some of the more devious and um you know scandalous um comedians and what sort of stories they could kind of pull from them to put in a bigger piece about the toxic nature of stand-up comedy in la or california and that never really transpired i think that was probably that i think is one of the reasons why some people said that Eddie Bravo's disappeared, right? We don't see Eddie Bravo on the podcast now at the moment. That supposedly is part of the issue. This kind of rumor was going around in a scene that everyone was going to get taken down. So that might have been the reason why a lot of these guys stepped away from Chris and Brian, right? Because they just didn't want to be anywhere near the collateral damage if that sort of like, you know, cancelling um, Hiroshima bomb went off anywhere, right? And they've all, you know, for the most part, most of these guys, with the exception of Brendan, have kind of worked really hard to get their position in Hollywood. The last thing they want is to be cancelled for something they didn't do. So I can kind of understand where they're coming from in that regard. Yeah. And people that I knew, I've known for 15, 20 years. Did you know that they were up to these shenanigans? You know, I'm I'm staying... Um, you know, I've said my piece on, on those on that on those issues. Pussy. Um, PC around him. He's the perfect guy to talk about. This. I, I know. What's yeah. the deal, bro? Let's talk, man. I Who think gives this a is fuck? the perfect time to actually do it and say. And if you're wondering why Bobby Lee's being a little bit res res um, hesitant to kind of jump in and say his piece, he also had a a period just after I think no, recently, maybe a few months ago, where it seemed like people were. It seemed like there was a bit of momentum about getting him cancelled because of the very questionable stories that he had concerning his um tendency when he was single to go to parts of Southeast Asia and acquire the services of very young women, right? And some of the stories were very, very questionable. And then he then came out in expert way to deflect and sort of kind of defeat the situation. He kind of confessed that some of these stories are lies, which is, you know, we know most stories comedians tell on stage aren't true. But he then suggested that everything he says is a lie, which definitely way to protect himself because he felt as if the cancelling hammer was going to go and smash the top of his head. But that's why he's being a little bit scared. And he has no backbone. Well, what I told those guys and what I publicly said on podcasts is I... I I don't know what I don't know, right? Yeah. Um, you know, when, you, when you're with guys and, you know, obviously these two gentlemen that were brought down. They Who are we talking about? We're talking about Dilly and Callen? <laughs> <laughs> these two gentlemen? Like, it's like, people gentlemen. know, right? Uh, I know, I know. No, we don't know. He's yeah. so nervous. <laughs> these 
Be <laughs> gentle, man. I, I don't I'm, want you to talk about anything that makes you uncomfortable. No, no, it's, yeah. it's not that I'm uncomfortable, and yeah. I'm, I'm willing to talk about it. It's, um, is I know them in one way, right? Okay. Yeah. Like, I'm their, like, you know, silly, you know, friend. Yes. And their silly, like, you know, Asian guy friend. Yes. And we giggle, and we, we go out to diners, and we, you know, hey, you, you want to see Toki the Dum Dum, which is my penis, <laughs> right? So I go, you want to see Toki? And, you know, we're eating pancakes. Uh, it's right? possible that bit. <laughs> I know. I know. I will next time. Thank you. Awesome Bring that joke up. <laughs> yeah, very um, encouraging and helpful to my own personal life and career. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. it's like, you know, I have this specific, you know, relationship with these guys. Yeah. I don't know what they do. You know what I mean? Behind closed doors, I see them at the clubs, and then sometimes we'll go out to eat. You know yeah. I mean? So yeah. it's like it's a, it's. A that's the narrative that I didn't like. That's the same thing that Brendan and Brian did when they started crying on camera. Brendan did the epic line, "I can't talk." Right. I don't think any sensible person honestly believes that they had no idea that both of their friends were maybe some creeps and pussy hounds. I don't think that's true. I think they all knew, right? Brian spoke quite oftenly about how you know. Um, how much you know how many girls used to get back in there when using comedy and you know he's always talking about that sort of stuff um, Chris D'Elia made complete sense considering that he was essentially you know got his much of his success early from Vine the fact that he's always posting pot top, topless pictures of himself on social media right it makes complete sense that he would be a little bit of a fiend when he gets on the road that's not surprising especially from people that are closest to them who see them you know at night when some of this more devious behavior comes out of them so so some of them to suggest that they only knew the comedic side of them the helping you out with bits and tags side of them is really 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 disingenuous like they must think we're all idiots but again i think it's less about us and it's more so about um kind of uh keeping the the journalists with their pitchforks at bay that's probably more so to do with it but i'm sure most of them knew again I, I don't think they knew you know allegedly that Callan was out here raping women but i know for sure most of them knew that Callan and Gadelia were definitely pussy hounds that is uh, there's no way I, i'm not i'm not gonna believe that it's a weird thing like, i don't I, like that how people there are certain people who think it's like your or other people's responsibility sorry, i like to... carla Scap, the skipper because mm. relevant shit in your hand <laughs> I You're know. not responsible for your behavior. <laughs> that's right? like, like, I'm responsible for that. Exactly. Right? Yeah. No, but yeah, I think that's unfair. Like to put that in, and I think that that's why I felt part of it was like a lashing out because what I saw a lot was this: there'd be an accusation against like Chris or Callan, right? Yeah. And then the the nerds or like these comics that weren't getting up at the store, they weren't like getting up. At, and even New York, I heard like I saw like New York comics tweeting about it. Like, why the fuck did you don't even know these people? Yeah. And what they were the the way that they would tweet is, yeah. The L.A. Uh, kingpins are going down. No, there's two people who have been accused of this, but it yeah. seems like you've had a lot of like animosity towards this one group of people, and you're looking forward to their demise. Mm. And I thought that was kind of corny, you know, because, yeah, because you actually want... And that's interesting part of it. I think that's a good point that he makes, and it's also something I think that you could ascribe to the journalist. I think when the deal got, because again, I, I think some of these journalists are just, you know, what did Tim didn't say? They have less dignity or they have less dignity than a prostitute. Like they just, you know, they're unscrupulous, horrible people. Stay away from journalists. But I think a lot of these journalists definitely had their nose put out of shape when the news got leaked about Joe Rogan's Spotify deal. You saw it with the lady, what's her name? Alyssa Milano. She tweeted out saying oh, she can't believe that Joe Rogan has so many listeners when she feels that she has a superior pro pro podcast and what she does, whatever it may be. So there's definitely a, not a hint, a large spoonfuls of clipping jealousy when it comes to the Joe Rogan stuff. But I think they were so unaware of what was going on in the podcasting world that when that news came out, it sort of all caught them off guard. Like, no way can this um, right-wing, racist, um, homophobe guy be getting so much money from a company they deem to be very liberal in Spotify, which they kind of generally are, which kind of a bit of a kick in the teeth. So that might have been a precursor to the cancellations because then they saw all these friends who they kind of deem to be deplorable or, you know, questionable human beings, the people, you know, the people that Seth Simon writes about on his Twitter account, they will definitely be like, okay, cool. If we can't take out the main dude because he sort of inoculated himself and he has a few money, let's take out some of his associated um, or some of his associates, like people like Brian Callan, who he's been friends with for more than 20 years. And the hope I think that they had was that 
by taking those guys out and it's, it's kind of associating them or directly pointing to Joe as the main common denominator, it would somehow muddy his name and then lead essentially to, I don't know, his deal getting ripped up. I don't know, whatever it may be. I think that was definitely in the works there. One, don't care about the girls. You just care about seeing these people that like made you feel inferior go down. Mm. And that's right. the most selfish part of it all. Like right. if you actually yeah. really cared about the girls, yeah. I understand your 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 I understand your anger. Yeah. You know, but if you just want to see someone you don't like go down, you're a bitch, dude. Yeah. And wasn't that that's a great point too, because it wasn't that miss opportunity. Because I think there's definitely something to be said about the difficulty in navigating um any kind of industry that takes place at night right i think we've seen it with djs already i've, I've spoken about it with eric Mueller's story there's definitely something that happens there's definitely a different experience if you're trying to come up in a scene if you're a man and you're a woman working in the entertainment industry whether you're working as a bouncer as a bar back as a dj as a comedian as a singer it's definitely different and there's definitely pressures and um you know very um troubling situations that each person gets themselves in more so than women that we definitely need to look at as a kind of scene or as a society and kind of make some or make up some solutions that's going to mitigate or kind of resolve those issues so there was a missed opportunity there with the crystal Leo and brian cullen story right in terms of hey why do some of these young female comedians feel like they need to get involved in any way shape or form sexually with somebody in that industry to make it that shouldn't be something that they should feel that they should have to do if they want to do it because they have you know agency over their own bodies fair enough but it shouldn't be one of those things that's sort of like an unsaid thing that's sort of out there that you can do because i'm sure for some people it has definitely worked right we've heard these stories about flipping harvey weinstein and that how despicable and horrible of a person that he was right that there were stories that supposedly he had sorted out some people with you know he, he basically was responsible for advancing some female a um, actors careers uh if they were willing to exchange certain sexual favors with him again no deplorable no one should ever demean themselves to that level and of course he's having to um serve his sentence in prison so he's been judged in that regard but that is definitely a thing that exists now that shouldn't be existing so there's a prime opportunity there to sort of you know attack that situation and address it head on but it didn't. Instead, it just turned into a, let's just take down those two guys so that we can get their spots. Because I'm sure there was a lot of that too, right? A lot of people saying, oh, especially Chris Lear because he's got more of a sort of slap, slap-tastic-y, bro -y sort of way of doing comedy. I'm sure a lot of people were like, yeah, we wanted him to get cancelled because we just don't like his stand-up. And he went to have the other friends promoted. Like, you look at the kind of venom um and sort of anger that that girl what's her name and the girl that was on Bert's podcast the Irish girl when she came on and she was complaining about the lack of women in comedy and stuff like she was really angry like whether not you agree what she says or not there was that she definitely felt like she'd been hard but done by by the scene right she definitely felt like the LA community scene would was sort of like purposely putting up roadblocks more so than they would do for a man and not allowing it to flourish now you kind of sprinkle that story, kind of narrative in her head with some rampant, you know, misogyny, whatever it may be, you're going to have a problem at your hands, isn't it? But again, they didn't have a chance to um, address it in any way, shape or form. Instead, it's just take out the individual so that we can advance ourselves, which is, you know, um, again, you're not protecting the victims. You're not really addressing anything. You're just kind of looking out for yourself. And it sort of like reminds me a little bit of what happened with the, with the Me Too movement at the end where essentially i think it wasn't me too or one of those charity one of those kind of um uh initiatives where essentially they found out that a lot of the money hadn't been used in the right way a lot of the people had kind of you know selfishly um advanced their own careers off the back of that collective goal like a lot, a lot of unscrupulous characters come in and take advantage of that situation so it's no surprise that that's what happened there i also that's i, I agree but i also when people and this is something that i left out when all this shit was going down yeah. in my public statements was, um, you know, um, so scared in it <laughs> because there's this narrative that these two guys are like, you know, predators and, you know, what I mean, bad people. Right. And, you know, the narrative that I have. Right. And this is sincere is, is that um, and I, you know, that 
I see them as giving loving people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that's who they were to you. To me, hey, you're allowed to feel yeah, that to way. To me, you it's know, like I, your grandparents around you are sweet, and yeah. around like a black guy, they're probably not as sweet. Yeah, that's just like I said. <laughs> <laughs> like that's you true. still love your grandparents. Yeah. I think it's a great point and I think essentially that is where that's the issue that I kind of had with a lot of the responses and I think that's how literally a lot of people had especially if, if you're meant to be your friends I think friendship should be that friendship should be hey I don't agree with what you are allegedly been accused of but I've had more good times than bad times with you as a friend so I'm going to be with you as a friend I'm going to hold that memory in my head and when someone asks me about you that's what I'm going to comment on and you didn't hear that a lot you didn't hear a lot of people say hey he was a good guy to me I don't know you know I, 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 well, I've never seen something like him do something like that and I'm going to be there for him as much as I can support him through this bad time that he's going through and then hopefully um, reach to some sort of conclusion I don't know whatever just something of those kind of lines you didn't hear that all you heard was people distancing themselves kind of adopting and co-opting the language that was being used online by people that wanted their careers to kind of, that wanted obviously the person that was accused to go down there was not a real lot of standing up for them there was more so a lot of kind of sad excuse making and distancing right the whole Brian Callum thing I've never done a show with him I've never been on tour with him we don't hang out I only see him at the comedy store and then you see loads of clips come on the line of them obviously hanging out and acting like best friends it's just like what are you doing do you know what I mean like if, if you can't be there for your friends who the hell are you going to be there for and it's again it's ironic that the way that Brian kind of acted towards Crystal Lee especially in public regarding the allegations um he was kind of hit with it even f- you know with a far more serious allegation of rape and he essentially has been relegated to doing shows behind a paywall on on fucking patreon screaming at flat earth denies you know what i mean it's just or flat earth believers sorry it's just a very very um crazy way to end the year but again let's see man hopefully chris kind of comes out from the comes out of hiding and we see him very soon but what do you think do you think chris is going to come back anytime soon or do you think it's a wrap for him going forward i would like to see him come back again i think there is a opportunity for him to redeem himself i think mistakes have been made of course i'm sure he's learned from it hopefully he doesn't slide in anyone's dms anymore regardless if they're 18 or not and just kind of uh, concentrate his home life but um let's see let's see let me know in the comments down below Okay, that is the Axiom Zing Show, number 415, I think, here. Yeah. Thanks so much for tuning in, as per usual. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's your first time tuning into the show, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please give me a five-star review, share the show, and download it, and all that malarkey. And, of course, support via Patreon is always more than welcome. Patreon.com, for just Agostino. That's Patreon.com, for just Agostino. Links in the bio, links down below in the descriptions. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Take care. Be safe. Peace. Yes.